Okay, so uh, hello and welcome everyone to um, tonight's live broadcast, and it's called Humanities in the School Makerspace. Um, and just some quick background. Um, the Maker and Learning Institute is a professional learning uh, institute, which was funded by the Edward E. Ford Foundation back in 2014. Um, and Eric and I, uh, via the Marymount School in New York, were charged to design a very different professional learning experience for teachers. Um, and so we started out back in the fall of 2014, where we um, ran six events at the Marymount School in New York, where we had 85 attendees from 40 schools in five states. The second year, we followed that up with another six events and had 275 uh, attendees from 42 schools in 10 states. And in its third year, uh, we had five events and 240 people attending those from 30 schools in 10 more states. And that year as well, we added one publication. So let me talk a little bit about the MLI or Maker Learning Institute, which really was um, just a professional learning Institute where we wanted educators to share their teaching and learning experiences. Um, and every year we tried different iterations. We had workshops, we had immersions in maker spaces where you were just brought through the school. We had conversations with teachers, students, and makers. We had a, um, a student technology uh, online conference. Um, and this year uh, we're trying something different because we're always looking at different channels to try and bring more people in. And so we thought of the idea of maybe we have a podcast series about making and learning. And so what you're watching tonight is the first live broadcast of such a thing. Um, what will happen is in, within the next week, we will have this, what we see tonight edited and up on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Um, but tonight, um, we're really excited to welcome from the Harpeth Hall School um, <clears throat> two people there, um, K Caitlin and Caitlin McLemore and Molly Rumsey. And thank you guys in advance, um, coming in from Nashville, Tennessee, um, to talk about the work you do at Harpeth Hall and specifically around the theme of humanities in the school makerspace. So um, let's jump right into it, and um, I'll let you to introduce yourself first. I know you're going to give a brief uh, presentation on the work you do, and then uh, we'll have a dialogue conversation um, prompted from your presentations, and then we'll bring some other folk in who are joining us tonight as well. Sound sure. good? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you all so much. We're really excited um, about this opportunity to talk about the Design Den, which is our makerspace. Um, I'm Molly Rumsey. I'm the Director of Information Services at the Harpeth Hall School. Um, so I oversee both the library and the technology departments. I've been at Harpeth Hall for 23 years. Um, and so excited to, to talk with y'all a little bit tonight. And hi everyone, I'm Caitlin McLemore. I'm the Academic Technology Specialist at Harpeth Hall. And so my job is to work with students and teachers to effectively and meaningfully integrate technology. Uh, and that also involves uh, coordinating projects in our school makerspace. And this is my fourth year at Harpeth Hall. I'm excited to be here tonight. So we're gonna share a brief presentation with you all. I'm gonna start and just give you a, a brief overview of our makerspace, the beginnings of our makerspace and then really turn it over to Caitlin and let her share her screen where she'll speak specifically about projects and things we've done with humanities um, in our makerspace. So let me see if I can make this happen. Right. Okay. Can y'all see my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so let me tell you just a little bit about Harpeth Hall. For those of you who may not be familiar, as Don said, we are in Nashville, Tennessee. We're an all-girls school, grades 5 through 12. Um, we have about 700 girls on a 40-acre campus um, in the heart of a residential area of Nashville. Harpeth Hall and our predecessor schools um, date back 150 years. So we have a rich history. Um, Harpeth Hall was one of the first laptop schools um, in the region. And so we've been um, leading in technology is something that, that we pride ourselves upon. So our design gen, um, back in the summer of 2014, we um, received a gift from our parents association 
that allowed us to take two underutilized classrooms that were located in our library um, and knock out the walls, rip out the ceilings, rip out the floors, and, and to make it a space um, that would work for us. And so here you'll see some after pictures. Um, just a, a few things logistically about this space. Everything is, is on wheels, and this is a really good picture of it. If you could see it today, it's like a bomb went off. Um, so th these are pretty pictures uh, when we first opened, but everything is on wheels or stackable, which allows us to configure the room um, lots of different ways. Um, one side is really dedicated to more of our high tech. We have our 3D printers, our laser cutter. The other side is really our power tools, um, hand tools, arts and crafts. Um, here's our laser cutter. Um, so we, we have a lot of different supplies. Um, we, have a, we have a glass partition in the room that allows us to make two different spaces if we need to, or one large open space um, for the girls. And so after about six months, um, we were able to open the design den in the winter of 2015. And in designing our maker space, um, we, let me go back a couple, let me just let you all see a picture. In designing this space, we have a group of math and science teachers and even a few art teachers who really helped us dream. Um, what did we want in this space? How would this space be used? And so they were really fired up. And so when we opened the space in January of 15, we were, um, expecting our math and science teachers to, to use the space um, extensively. So we were really surprised um, how enthusiastic our humanities teachers were. And so Caitlin um, has been able to partner with many of our humanities teachers to create um, projects from, scr from scratch, to do small projects, big projects. Um, many, many teachers took projects that they already had in place and tweak them a little bit um, to be able to use this, this wonderful space. So we're fortunate that every girl, grades five through 12, has the opportunity to use this space and every grade has used this space. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's been a great um, a great win for us and it's a lot of fun. So I'm gonna turn it over to Caitlin and she can speak specifically to humanities classes. She's gonna talk about lots of different classes, different grade levels, how she's worked with teachers and, and, and what our girls have been able to do. Sorry. Um, let me see if I can do this. Caitlin. Let's see if I can I'm going gonna... to stop share and see if you can turn it over to you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, let me get into presentation mode. Oops, sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. Got to fly through those slides. Okay. Uh, and some of these projects were in, if you read from prototype to pitch, uh, some of them were highlighted in our chapter there, uh, but then we've got some other projects that we've done since then or some just different activities. Uh, so I'll start with fifth grade. Uh, we don't always use all of the tools for all of our projects. So our fifth grade geography class at the beginning of the year, they come in and do just a brainstorming session and they use the idea paint on the walls uh, to brainstorm uh, their ideas for a physical poster that they create. Um, so that's just a, a good way to introduce them to the space without necessarily overwhelming them um, with all of the different tools. Uh, in reading, in the spring, they do a civil rights unit and they create a civil rights timeline. So they, each pair of girls researched a significant um, event in the civil rights movement and they created a symbol. And you can see those wooden circles. Uh, they design those on their computers. All the girls have touch screen laptops, so they drew them on their computers and then we etched them in the laser cutter. And they also had to have a little paragraph that went with it. Uh, in sixth grade, the distinguished women, uh, each girl researches a distinguished woman from history. And of course they love to do the brainstorming and sketching on the idea paint. Uh, but then they also had to create some sort of symbol uh, using the tools that we had in the laser cutter uh, or, or the laser cutter or just recycled materials in the design den. So we kind of left it open-ended for them. Uh, we just wanted them to have something that was meaningful for their, uh, for their person. So you can see there was a ballerina uh, that was etched on the laser cutter and then painted a, 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 a famous chemist and then also a, a performer. And she did a little bit of laser cutting and a little bit of arts and crafts. So we really do try to keep it creative and open-ended with the projects. Uh, something simple, sixth grade does whisper phones where they can 
uh, proofread uh, to themselves in the classroom and not have 20 voices all at once or 15 voices all at once. So. And they all had to, for this project, uh, use a power saw. Um, so that was a really great experience for them. In sixth grade geography, they study ancient civilizations. And for this project, they were creating a museum exhibit. And they had to, one of their pieces in their exhibit had to be something that they made in the design den. Uh, they, they worked in groups from class to class. So there's four sections in sixth grade. Um, and they had different topics such as health or, or science or pets. Uh, or animals and, and they, they had to create something uh, out of recycled or found material. So we do try to use recycled or, or upcycled materials as much as we can. Uh, in sixth grade reading, they read The K and A Long Walk to Water and Star Girl. And a project that they do in the design den is to create a connections piece uh, showing the connections between the three books. There's a lot of common symbols and themes. And, and so you can see in some of these pictures, it's one symbol, but some of them it's uh, in the top right corner, you can see comparing and contrasting the, the setting from two of the books. So that's a really great project to kind of extend and really think deeply about what they read in class. In eighth grade, another simple project, we had Rosie the Riveter Day, uh, where students got to experience using a bunch of different power tools. And while they may not have been the same tools that Rosie the Riveter used, it, it, it was an interesting connection to what they were learning in class. Uh, and then while they were waiting to use the power tools, they also learned a little bit about Ward Belmont, our predecessor, uh, during, during the time that Rosie Riveter uh, was popular. <clears throat> seventh grade Latin, uh, they built some Roman villas or a replication of Roman villas using cardboard and styrofoam. Uh, so we did have to buy new material for that, but that was a lot of fun. Uh, the girls, it, it, it really is a skill to cut out um, and measure the, the walls and, and really be thoughtful and mindful about uh, measurement in space. Uh, and, and that was a really interesting project. On to 10th grade English honors, uh, our Siddhartha project. So the girls read Siddhartha, uh, which is all about the hero's journey. And they originally, this project was, they had to write a, a paper and analysis, uh, but we added in an element where each girl got a six by six inch block of wood. And they had to represent one stage of the hero's journey uh, using that block of wood. And they had to use the laser cutter and they also had to bring in some other element. You can see there's um, some paint, there's some cutouts of shapes. Um, this one on the left is pretty intricate as far as interlocking pieces of wood, uh, but the girls got really creative with it. And this was also a collaboration with their art teacher who came in and talked about different visual elements that they could bring into their project. In Latin four, they researched ancient Rome and each of the girls had a character that they had to research or a, a different a Roman soldier or a, a matriarch. And they had to create a, a piece of clothing that that person would wear. And our, on the right hand side is our uh, Latin teacher, uh, Gerard White, and he's you know, helping the girls sew and, and he made a, a piece too. And, and that was really interesting because you know, we had been asking about doing sewing projects. We had teachers ask about sewing and this was the first one that we uh, br actually brought in a sewing machine. Um, AP English Literature, after they take the AP test, we have a couple weeks of school left. So the girls come in and uh, make bookmarks from, with quotes from the books that they've read. And they, uh, they really enjoy this because they get into the discussion and they're really reflective on what they read and what they learned and how much it impacted them. So it's, it's always fun and, and it's a fun atmosphere, of course, because they're, they're happy to be done. <laughs> um, a couple highlights from enrichment classes as well. Uh, in seventh grade art, we had a continuous lines project where the students have to do a self portrait with continuous lines, but then we also etched their continuous line <coughs> drawings into uh, laser cutter. And then we also used the 3D doodler 
And then the girls had the idea of looking at each other through the glass and then trying to draw themselves through the glass. And that was an interesting lesson on perspective uh, because of the difficulty of going through the glass and then also staying still. And there were just a lot of different elements um, from that to paper. We've also had a PE class in the design den, believe it or not. Uh, the PE classes study the Olympics and they join uh, countries and compete as they learn different sports throughout the year. And so the eighth graders got to make a symbol for their country in the design den. Some of them used the laser cutter, some of them did a little bit more arts and crafts with painting and finding recycled materials, but it was fun to have PE making things as well. And then we have a program in January for our upper school students called Winterum where they take non-traditional classes. One of those is teen reads and some of the girls got to choose, uh, they, they all got to choose an independent project, but some of the girls chose to do something in the design den. On the left hand side is a laser cutter, a, a girl redesigned the cover of a book. She thought the book she read had a really boring cover, so she redesigned one. Uh, and then on the right hand side, there's some 3D printed symbols from uh, that book, The Becoming of Mara Dyer. I believe that is the end of all of those. Uh, that was a quick run through of a lot of the different projects that we've done, uh, but we've been very grateful and happy to have um, good partnerships with a lot of our communities teachers. So I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, awesome. Bring right. it back here. Wow. Wow. Thanks, Caitlin. Amazing stuff there. Um, before I jump in and, you know, ask you specifics about the projects, what I noticed um, from reading your article in the prototype to pitch, the first publication of the Maker and Learning Institute, that um, all of the work of these projects um, had to do with representation. So you focused a lot on not doing a norm of how you would maybe do something in the humanities, but gave another representation. How did you convince teachers to get on board with that? I, I think we could both speak to this one. So, some of it came from the teachers, and, and particularly our middle school teachers who, who are willing to, to try something new. Um, and, and our teachers are always looking for ways to, to help the girls shine in a way that maybe they, they don't. And in a, you know, in a typical classroom setting, you know, some of our girls are incredible writers, others that may not be their gift um, yet, um, but being able to, to, to express themselves um, in a different way something we've seen in the design den. Girls, as I said, may, may not be a leader in the classroom, may not, you know, writing may not be her gift, math may not be her gift yet, um, but when they go into the design den, they, they, they have opportunities to, to express themselves, to, to create things, to, to, to um, be leaders um, in ways that, 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 they, that they aren't if they're just sitting in math class. So that's been a, a beautiful thing I think we've seen is, is, is I can think of a, a great example of a, or, from, veer a little bit, but it was a math class, and they were making soccer goals out of PB, PVC pipes, um, and, and one of the girls that, so they had to measure and, and do angles, they were learning about the Pythagorean theorem, and a girl who was not a strong math student, um, math was not her, her best subject, really shined in that because she had used some of the power tools, um, and she could really take the lead, show some of her classmates, this is how you use a power tool, nope, make sure you wear your goggles, um, so she was able to shine in a way um, so I, I veered a little bit from the representation piece, but I think the makerspace has enabled us to, to take projects. Um, we're not just writing a paper in English, um, but they're still learning all the, all the same. I, I think Siddharth is a great example. I mean, they're still learning about the hero's journey, but thinking about it in a completely different way. Um, it's still getting those lessons um, that the teachers want. And so it's, we've got some pretty eager teachers that, that don't need a lot of nudging. Um, would you agree, Caitlin? I'm gonna let you, you talk. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've had teachers come to me who say, I don't know what I want to do, but I really want to use the design den. I see that this is a great space. Uh, so that's part of what I do is work with them to come up with uh, ideas of, and, and making sure that we connect everything back to the curriculum, like Molly said, um, because that's the way that we, you know, we may have open-ended projects or we may have creative projects or girls are doing all sorts of different things. Uh, but it all ties back to what they're learning. And it, it's, it's meant to deepen the classroom learning experience. Um, and, and some of it too is, I think, um, 
student excitement really gets teachers uh, interested and, and maybe a little bit of peer pressure too. You know, they see this great project that the girls are excited about, the teachers are excited about, and then they, they want to get involved as well. Right, yeah. No, I, I mean, I think it's awesome that there's other ways to represent things and getting, mm -hmm. you know, faculty to understand that, that it's not about the five paragraph essay. Right. right. So, and, and I often think that like, um, you know, as visual learners, it's time for revenge, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have Instagram as a point of expression and, and all of that. And, you know, that really struck me with the way you, that paper that you guys wrote was about representations and really letting people see how there are other ways to represent ideas other than writing. And the learning is just as deep and writing is incredibly important. And the, and the girls get a tremendous amount of writing, but, but it's exposure, like you said, representing things in a different way but the learning is still as deep and it allows different girls to shine and feel some success, which is great. Right. So w with the representations, um, Molly and Caitlin, like what would you, is there one that you think has the most impact that you saw, like picking any of those projects, what representation do you think needed no other explanation, but it was just, wow, I got it. Caitlin, you can probably address that better than I can. As far as, impact um, visually yeah like the one that like the one that struck me i'm i'm like i jotted down all your projects were the whisper phones mm -hmm. yeah. that i mean i saw that and i was like wow yeah you know and it's, even though i didn't quite understand the project i'm still curious mm -hmm. to like oh my god what is that that whisper yeah. phone, you know yeah. um so t t talk a little bit more about that the, the whisper phone and where the ideas came from and what was the objective and how did it end up as that? Sure. Uh, well, the, the whisper phones are really fun because it, it's an interesting project because it's very simple, but mm -hmm. it really does help them in the classroom because the idea behind the whisper phone is they can talk to themselves. So mm -hmm. they're, they're making these phones that facilitate uh, proofreading and, and so it's they're making something and it's something that's their own uh, so they're learning the skill of using a power tool they're getting to decorate it they're getting to represent themselves in a visual way right they they all decorated their whisper phone uh, but then it's also re helping them learn new skills in English class so it's helping them with writing and reading and speaking uh, because they're able to to express themselves that way well, and I think a great, another thing a great, that's great about the whisper phones is really how that started was a teacher came to, to me and wanted to buy whisper phones um, for the girls to use in the class. And so it's just a you know, little, little thing that they can just whisper to themselves, they hear themselves, but they were $5 a piece, which is not a lot. Um, but then we started talking and we pulled Caitlin in and we said, you know what, we can make these for pennies. Um, and so it's, it was kind of a dual win. The girls were making their own. So they had the experience of making the school that cost almost nothing and the girls get to take it with them and use it. So it's not just an end project um, or a representation of, of a project or something that they've learned. It's something they've gone in, made themselves and then used themselves and they're proud of them. They're proud of them and they're great. They're great. And so it's, it's not really a long project, but it's something the girls are going in, making themselves um, and using in the classroom, which is great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think it's, it's amazing as well because the, the phone is so such an iconic object mm -hmm. you know, in this day and age, right? Like we're all tethered to our phones. The students all have phones. They're such powerful objects. And, you know, you know the, the whisper phone, looking at this sort of you know, analog digital thing um, is pretty powerful, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but no, yeah, look, amazing project. Um, so I want to go back out much broader and like y you guys use the word research in a lot of these projects. Just talk to the audience more about your research techniques. Like what are they, like is there a pr progression in that? Is there a very basic type of research that you do for the younger kids? And how does that get more complex as you go up? But talk about the research process. Caitlin, you want to go first then I'll fill in. Sure. Uh, well, we are a combined library and technology department, which I think is unique. Uh, and, and so we do a lot of uh, uh, collaboration with myself, the teachers, and then also our librarians. We have a middle school and an upper school librarian. Uh, and, and so 
there's a, a lot of teamwork involved uh, where our librarians do a really good job of teaching girls proper research skills and information literacy skills. Uh, so they're really learning the research skills, then they're applying it in the design den. So they, they learn, they research, and then they apply what they've learned uh, by making something. And, and we're really fortunate, again, because we are library and technology um, together, which is very purposeful, and we're also all in the same building. And so Caitlin's office is right next to the upper school librarian. She's right across the hall from the middle school librarian and then the, and the design den is downstairs. Um, and so it's, it's not only are we really a, a department, but we're physically all in the same building, which, which, which really makes the collaboration a, a lot easier. And then to add on to the, to the research skills, we also have a, a pretty extensive um, information literacy skills um, matrix. Um, that, that's a, it's, a, well, it's not a matrix, it's really a progression. What, what should a fifth grader be able to do? What should a seventh grader be able to do? What should a ninth grader be able to do? And so we're able to scaffold those skills um, where it's appropriate. And, and again, Caitlin and our, and our um, librarians work very closely together to make sure, okay, are we hitting all these skills? It's September, we need to be doing this, but a project in March would look very different depending on um, what the girls have been exposed to prior to that. Yeah. So the research is sort of a, a method behind the object that is produced or the product that's produced. And so like the, the other thing that you mentioned as, as a method that I'm uh, curious to hear more about is brainstorm. Take us tr through how you do a brainstorm with you know, any of the students from, you know, from start and how does it end up? Well, with, with any project, we always have guiding questions. You know, what, why are we doing this project? What is the end goal? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, and, and then more content specific questions as well. Uh, but there's always definitely a, a guide for them. So they're not just, they're, they're not aimless, right? Uh, we, we want them to, to know that there's a, a process that you go through and that we really want to be deliberate. Um, I do ask the girls a lot why you know, why are you choosing this? Even when we get to the design and the making piece, why are you choosing this material? Why are you choosing this color? Why are you choosing, you know, paints versus uh, car colored paper or, or, or even really some of those minute details, really wanting them to think about throughout the process, their, their purpose and, and their meaning for choosing things and doing things. Uh, but typically with the a project, the students will get a project introduction in class um, and then they might come for a brainstorming day in the design den uh, where I introduce the space to them and kind of the options that are available for this particular project because not all projects get to use all, all things uh, just because of time constraints or just the, the purpose and the nature of the project. Uh, so we go over those and, and then we have them brainstorm and then we always encourage them also to sketch out what they want to do and to have a plan. We ask them to do materials lists. Um, and of course, all of those things change throughout a project because inevitably something doesn't work or we don't, we run out of something or, you know, it's not always perfect in the design process, of course, uh, which is a, a learning experience in itself. Uh, but we do want them to be planning and be deliberate and thoughtful about the process. And, and I think this is a tiny thing when it comes to brainstorming, but I think this is a girl specific thing, but if the, because they can write on the walls and they can write on the glass, it's amazing what, just taking them to a different space, if they were brainstorming in the classroom versus if they come to the design den, they can write anywhere they want, on anything they want. Um, they love it. And they said they just keep going. It's, so it's, it's, it's something as simple as being able to write on the walls or write on the, or write on the glass wall um, goes a long way, goes a long way. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, it's like graffiti, right? Mm -hmm. It's very pleasurable to be able to write everywhere. Yeah. Uh, well, the first, the first time a fifth grader walks in and you hand her a marker and you say, "Okay, go write on the wall," I mean, they look at you like, "What?" Um, they love it. They love it. It's great. Yeah. So, Don, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, in chat. Uh, mm -hmm. This is for obviously for Caitlin and Molly. It's from Megan. Uh, and since you were talking about the design, then this is more of a logistical question. Could you please share how the den is staffed Monday through Friday, seven to four? Has the staffing model changed over time? And dare I ask, is it open on Saturdays and Sundays to allow girls additional time to tinker and create? Sure, I can answer that question. So we, we don't have one person dedicated to the space, um, seven to four. 
Um, Caitlin is, is our main contact, though we also have one of our um, technicians in our, in our Bear Cave, which is our help desk um, that, that helps with a lot of the maintenance of the machine. So they're, they're the two main contacts, but I would say Caitlin is, 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 is the one. Um, so if a teacher wants to use the design den, they talk to Caitlin first. And so she makes sure that, that we don't have overlap. We don't have three classes at once. We don't. So she oversees um, and we, we schedule that specifically. So she's, she's our main contact. We're not open on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, a great example, we're in Winterham um, this week. A girl who's off campus doing an internship emailed and said, can I come in and 3D, pre some, 3D print something for my um, internship? So she came to campus. Joel, who's our other technician, went into the, the, the designs in with her. Caitlin stays after school sometimes and will work with on a girl if she's doing an individual project. And so it's, it's we don't have one person staffed in there all the time, but it, right now it works. Um, do we envision that changing? Possibly, possibly. But so far having, it's, it's kind of a, we're all in this together. You know, and in the summer, Caitlin and I are down there with our um, cleaner and we're washing the walls and we're we're stacking up cardboard and we're you know it's 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 a it's a team um, and so it's that's how kind of how we're doing. Does that make sense, Megan? Okay, Don, back to you. Okay, so Caitlin, um, you mentioned you know uh, two words here. You said uh, sometimes it doesn't work or it didn't work, mm -hmm. um, and we know that's like so important. The whole idea of a uh, prototype is to get feedback and go through multiple iterations to actually get the better answer, not necessarily the right answer, but the better answer. Mm -hmm. So like in, in, in any of these projects that you do, like how many prototypes would your students come up with, just as an example, and how do you tackle the feedback loop in that? I mean, of course it varies from project to project. Some projects there's, with time constraints, there's less opportunities for, for tinkering um, or, or prototyping, but the, the, the sixth grade connections project is an example where they really, I find that sixth graders can struggle a little bit with that, not getting it right the first time. Um, so they do, it's really uh, a process where they, they show us maybe what they've got going and we kind of have a conversation about what works, what might not work. Uh, and then they go back and they, they, they edit. So there's several times that they go through uh, and we're, you know, the teachers are very involved and I'm very involved in, in helping them. And then they're working in groups too. Uh, but but that, that's kind of the age where they seem to butt up against the, you know, limitations of, or, or realities of design, I, I feel like. Uh, they've got these huge ideas and then they have to kind of keep, keep working at it to, to get there, uh, to, to make it happen. But it, it really is a, a conversation and, uh, between peers and then also with teachers as well. And Caitlin alluded to this, but I think it depends on a lot on the project. Um, but, mm -hmm. but for many projects, the, the teacher will say, you know, I expect there's going to be three different iterations of this. So a after this point, you can expect feedback, and then we're going to go want you to go back and, and, and redesign this. So a lot of times that groundwork is laid at the very beginning, so the girls know going in. First, first thing I do is not going to be the, the final product. So it's setting that groundwork. I think at the beginning is that the girls have that expectation going in really helps. Right. Hey, Don, we have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, I lost. Hold on. Oh, we have two questions. Uh, how many large pieces of equipment do you have? For example, sewing machines, laser cutters, and how do you manage to use these so everyone gets the time that they need? And how do you handle teaching students how to use things like the laser cutter? Do they get time to experiment uh, as they will with other materials and tools? I'll start and then Caitlin, you, you, can, you can dig in. So we have one laser cutter, we have four 3D printers. Um, and so it, it again depends on the project. Um, but if it's something, for instance, that every girl needs to laser cut something, that's, some, that, that's, that's an expectation that, that Caitlin will set in advance with the teacher to make sure that, that there is ample time so that every girl gets the opportunity to, to, to use the laser cutter and then probably mess it up a couple times and then come back and do it again. Um, or the project will be a combination of you may do this or this or this. And so we don't have 30 girls waiting to use the laser cutter. We might have six, mm -hmm. we might have six using one of the 3D printers. And so it's, it's we, we've gotten to a place where we know how long it takes 
to laser cut or to print a particular thing. And so we'll work with the teacher to make sure that um, we've got the time scheduled and the teacher has that expectation to make sure the girls um, know what's coming. And then in terms of using the machines themselves, as Caitlin mentioned, a lot of times there's, there's work in class, but then the first day they come to the design, then there's, there's, there's training. Um, and so that they understand the safety, they understand what they need to do. And then depending on what machine they'll use, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the girls um, so that they get um, experience and understand how to use the laser cutter. Caitlin, add to that. Sure. Uh, well, the, the great thing about the laser cutter is it, it's really simple and it, it's quick. So we can get through a lot of projects in one class. Uh, the, the laser cutter, you can etch any image file. So the girls with the fifth graders, they're not necessarily programming the printer, uh, but they're, de they're definitely doing the designing. And, and, then, um, and then if it's a project, like Molly said, we work with the teachers on the timing. Uh, so if every girl has to etch something or every girl has to cut something, there's other things that they're working on. So with the Siddhartha project, they kind of naturally fall into a progression and, and they kind of work out where they've got their names on the board of who's going next. Uh, but some girls' projects are more involved than others. And they're also working on their essay. They're also working on their um, artist statement that you know, each girl had to have a little paragraph explaining their symbol or maybe they're reading passages. So there, there's other things for them to do uh, and, and then again, an, another project that wasn't a humanities example, uh, but to speak to your question on failure and prototyping in math in eighth grade, they learn about flat patterns and 2D to 3D visualization. Uh, and they create 2D shapes and then fold them together. And then we've added on and they've always they, they did that before. But then in the design gen, they cut them in the laser cutter out of cardboard. And so the girls have to program essentially Microsoft Publisher to plot out all of the points of their 2D shape. And most of them don't get it right the first time. And, but it really only takes 30 seconds, a minute to make each of those. So the girls will go through three, four, five designs before their shape actually comes together. Uh, so that's the nice thing about the laser cutter in particular um, is it's quick and easy. Right, right. Eric, did you have a second question or can I? Uh, no, you can go. Oh, okay. So, um, Caitlin and Molly, um, with these projects that you described, you know, there were a specific project that all the students did. Have you any experience where it's a free for all and let's say you have 20 kids in the class and they decide what they're doing. So you have 20 different projects going on at once. And I'd love to you to talk to the audience about that, maybe how you manage it, um, you know, how it plays out. Caitlin, mm -hmm. okay, a museum project comes to mind first, but you may have, you may have um, a better example. <clears throat> the museum, uh, the connections project is also pretty open-ended. I mean, there, we don't necessarily have open hours. You know, all of the projects that the girls are doing are either projects in class, or the girls that come in with a specific request, like the girl with the 3D printer, or from the chapter, the AP art student, she approached me and said, I want to use the design pen. And, and we work together on, we've had some independent projects, but we don't necessarily have open house times um, at, at this point. You know, we're, we may explore that in the future. But uh, the projects where their product is a little bit more open-ended, like the museum project, like the connections project, it, it can get a little chaotic, <laughs> uh, but it's a good sort of chaos, right? Uh, and so we, we do manage it uh, differently depending on the different grade level. So in the upper school, they're able to kind of manage the space and manage their materials a little better. Uh, in the middle school and the younger grades, we do have to guide them a little bit more. You know, we have to kind of help them pour their paint or keep track of the hot glue. I mean, those glue sticks go like hotcakes. I mean, <laughs> paint, paint is a fiasco. Paint, paint is a fiasco. We have yeah. learned a lot about paint in middle school girls. <laughs> uh, but, but we're there to kind of help guide them or, or teach them or, or, you know, help them think about ways that they can be 
um, judicious maybe with the materials or ways that we can be sustainable or we talk about how to you know be responsible for the space so there it's it's a learning process throughout for sure right right um any audience questions eric uh we have one from southern california can you explain how your um the use of the design den has changed how you do your assessments Mm. Yikes. I, I'm not sure we can have we have a universal answer for that, but I think I think some of it you, Don talked about representations, you know, so instead of, of, of looking at a, a, a five paragraph essay, um, the teachers are developing rubrics to, to um, evaluate a, a, a laser cut um, representation of a, of a scene from the hero's journey. And so it's I think because particularly for humanities, we've, we've the teachers have pushed themselves outside of their own box a little bit. So it, it, it's beyond the oral report. It's beyond the five paragraph, five paragraph essay. It's beyond the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and so the, because the products are different, that, that's, they're assessing in a different way. They're assessing in a different way. But I, I would not say it's, it's universally changed assessment across the board. It hasn't. They still give traditional assessments. Um, but we're, it's, it's been a great first step, for sure. Great. Yeah. 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 I totally understand. Yeah, the it is sort of interesting how we often default back to a grade because I think it's, it's sort of easy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's like an an A whatever has such value more than you know a conversation about that representation and like, but how do you capture that? I guess it's hard. And a, a great example. It's not a humanities example, but there's a great um, our seventh grade science does a project where they build bridges. Um, and they are expected to, to fail. Um, they build a bridge, it has to hold a particular amount of weight, they film it, and so when it's holding the weight, they see the breaking point. Um, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, that's not a traditional assessment, but it, it does, and the grading is a little bit different. So that's a great way of, of the girls, you know, they're building something, they're testing something, it's failing, they're trying it again. It's really that engineering design process, um, which is a totally different way to think about it from the beginning, but that's a, that's a really great project where it's, based on um, how much weight it can hold, how much, um, how many times they, how well they prototype, how well they go back and, and revise based on what they saw in the film. And so it's, um, assessment's one of those big questions I think we're all wrangling with um, and we'll continue to. Yeah, absolutely. And what's sort of the thing with this is that, you know, we're driven by colleges because that's where the students go next. And it's, they, it's the trickle down. It's the trickle down. Yep. Right. So one final question about assessment then. Like, do you have any of your seniors, like either current or that have graduated, that have sort of shown a representation as an assessment in some way in their college app? I think the audience might be curious about that. Like, can you think of any one example that did someone write about something or it was a big part of their portfolio? You know, we had the one AP art student um, that, that used the design den um, for her AP portfolio. Um, but I can't, off the top of my head, that's not something that, that I have heard from our college counselors, that a, that a girl has used something um, that they've made um, as part of their um, portfolio to college. Right, great. Awesome. Well, um, Eric, any more questions from our audience? That's it. No? Okay. So um, I guess it's time to close out. We're at our 45 minutes. Um, but thank you, Caitlin and Molly, uh, for sharing all this awesome, these awesome projects and your knowledge and experience. We absolutely appreciate it. Um, and also that you're our first guest on this show. Mm -hmm. um, very brave of you as we've been talking a lot about prototypes that's what we've been doing um eric and i have lots of learnings from this which mm -hmm. we'll talk about i'm sure um but i want to thank you again for you know sharing all this knowledge with us tonight um and like i said within a week um we will have uh, this in a podcast format on google play itunes and soundcloud and on youtube which um Hopefully we'll have other people go and look at that or you, other, our audience and I can go back and, and see what happened again. But I want to thank everyone, our audience as well, for spending time with us tonight at our first Maker and Learning Institute podcast conversations. And uh, we're looking forward to our next one, which is March 14th. Right, Eric? No, February 7th. February 7th. 
um, with uh, Lorna from the Brunswick School. Who graciously joined us this evening, so. Yes, she did. And, that. Right, and uh, Lorna Lorna's, uh, will be talking about design thinking in the middle school art class. So thank you everyone and good evening. Hope the rest of your evening is great. And uh, if you're at NAIS, I'll, hopefully I'll bump into you down there. Okay. I'll see you then.